and welcome back to episode 95 of the Breaking Bio podcast. I'm Morgan Jackson, PhD student at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. Hi, I'm Tom Housley. I'm a postdoc at the University of Exeter in Penryn. And uh, yeah, like we're going to start calling this a season when we take these uh, unexpected breaks of two months. Uh, <laughs> that, that's how show business works. They have seasons and so do we at Breaking Bio. So welcome to season X. Uh, back. We're back. So that's the only thing that matters. And we've got a whole bunch of new guests lined up again, and uh, we're refreshed and recharged, and, and we're ready to talk all sorts of biology with, with new and exciting people. People like Dr. Kirstie McLeod, who is our guest this week, and who is also a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Cambridge. Welcome, Kirstie. Thanks a lot for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Great to be here. <laughs> uh, can you explain a little bit about what you do and, and what your interests are in biology and academia and everything else? Yeah, sure. So um, I started out working on meerkats, um, also at the University of Cambridge, is where I did my PhD. So um, that kind of that got me really interested in uh, parental care behaviour as well as alloparental care behaviour, which is what meerkats are mostly known for, where helpers help the dominant pair to rear their offspring. Uh, and I've I've since kind of moved on to look more at how parents vary and how much they invest in their young and that's kind of become my real core research interest. So how the environment varies, particularly what mothers invest in their offspring. So that's that's what I'm working on at the moment uh, in the hihi or also known as the stitch bird which is a, a bird from New Zealand, very endangered bird. Uh, and so with them I'm, I'm particularly exploring how carotenoid food supplementation influences maternal reproductive decisions. Uh, as I said, they're, they're really endangered and so they exist in these very few small translocated populations and most of those are now food supplemented. And so they're kind of exploring ways in which they can try and boost the population and carotenoid supplementation is one of those, we'll probably talk about it a bit later. But I'm, I'm really looking at how that influences what mothers put into their offspring and what the consequences are later on down the line. So you mentioned with the meerkats, alloparental care. Um, what What is that and why does it exist? Good question. So, so meerkats basically live in these groups of um, up to 40 individuals but with an average of about 15 and they're kind of the classic mammalian cooperative breeder which basically means that uh, one female in the group actually has offspring herself usually with just one male in the group so they form a dominant pair and then other individuals in the group help them to rear their offspring, either by feeding the offspring or helping to defend them. Or I was particularly looking at allo nursing, which is when other females in the group provide milk for the offspring. So cooperative breeding, so which is when you have this alloparental care, when helpers are helping to rear the offspring of a dominant pair or just a sort of central pair, uh, is, is pretty common in, in mammals and also in birds and in some fish as well. It's actually pretty common across a, a number of taxa. And it can take a number of forms. So as I said, it can be feeding, defense, uh, allo nursing, lactation, but it can also just be s as simple as just carrying around young when they're very precocial. Uh, altricial, sorry, I mean, so in primates, for, for example, that's kind of the main form that it takes. So there, there are lots of hypotheses for why this kind of helping behavior evolves. The kind of the best known and most classical explanation is the the Hamilton's rule idea of indirect fitness. So, if it's perhaps costly for you to try and create your own young and put resources into them, it might be just as beneficial to help a sister or a mother or another close relative to rear her offspring because then you're still your genes, which your sister or your mother shares, are also being passed along. But there are other hypotheses as well, like for allo nursing particularly, if, if you nurse for another female, perhaps she'll help to nurse your offspring as well. It might provide you some practice of parenting. Or it might just be a mistake in terms of allo nursing. <laughs> you might just not be able to tell your offspring from another offspring. Or particularly in ungulates, that's quite common. They just come up and it's sucking away and there's not... <laughs> Um, so within within these groups that there's this kind of alloparental care and allonursing then, is it mostly that they're all, the females in particular are all related or do you have sort of more genetic variation than that? Yeah, there's a fair amount of variation. It, it tends to be in 
that there's kind of a range of cooperative breeding. Um, so the very cooperative ones where it's just one pair that's allowed to breed tend to be slightly more highly related. So another really good example are the eusocial insects. So they are extremely highly related because of the haplodiploid uh, reproductive system, which means that sisters are more closely related uh, to each other than they would be to their own offspring. Um, so in, in those sorts of societies, you tend to get just a, a higher reproductive skew. So it's more likely that it's just one female that's producing all the offspring. Uh, but then you get kind of slightly looser social groups that this happens a lot in primates where you get a lot of variation in relatedness. Um, but then it might be more about group cohesion and it's more important to stay within the group. And helping might be a way of, of kind of ensuring your position in the group. So that's another kind of key hypothesis that's sort of known as the pay to stay hypothesis or the or it's it's more about direct benefits rather than the indirect genetic benefits. So if you help you're allowed to stay in the group and then you get all the benefits of, of being in a group. I, I vaguely remember an episode of Mere Cat Manor where uh, one was ejected from the group for trying to yeah. mate and then there was all all manner of things were befalling her. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, that's a good example actually because you do you do occasionally get less related females or completely unrelated females and males who, who help just as much as highly related males and females related to the dominant pair that is. So they're, they're a particularly extreme example where if you're separated from the group or if you're kicked out from the group, which as you said, does, it happens as a kind of mode of reproductive suppression by the dominant pair, then the chances of survival are so low that it's not really worth trying to reproduce yourself. It's better just to kind of toe the line. So for for the people who haven't been uh, lucky enough to follow along with your bio tweets, tweeting this week and seeing all your pictures, um, how do you actually study the meerkats in the wild? So the the field site where we where we conduct all the meerkat research is in the Northern Cape area of South Africa which is a really fantastic region. South Africa is just hugely varied anyway, but the Northern Cape is, is this kind of fantastic Kalahari desert landscape, uh, the kind of typical red sand pictures that you see. It's, re it's really beautiful. So the field site there has been run by my PhD supervisor, Tim Clottenbrook, for about 20 years now. Uh, and he spent probably about the first five years of that time just habituating groups which has really been the key to to the success of the meerkat system and absolutely necessary for all the work that we've done there. Uh, because it, it means that if you've seen any of the pictures on Twitter, you can basically be covered in meerkats and they're not paying you any attention. They're just kind of carrying on with their natural behavior, which is really amazing and it makes it a lot of fun to study them. So I, I went out for a couple of field seasons there of about four months each time. Uh, and you can... Um, you can follow the group and observe their behavior and the dominant female in each group is sort of the most stable member of that group because she's obviously not going to disperse when she has the resources of all these helpers. So she's the one that has a, a radio tracking collar on which we're able to follow um, with radio telemetry. So we can go out, find the groups and then follow them for a whole day if we want to and yeah, just observe their behaviors. They've been trained, trained is the wrong word because they still are wild and they do their natural behaviors, but they will jump onto a scale in return for a small reward of water or egg. So that's that's actually really quite special about this system. It's, it's very hard to weigh wild animals, especially on a regular basis. And, and there they've managed to get this system where you can get weights three mornings a week, three evenings a week, and so you really can track the, the growth of individuals right from birth to death. Um, and that's a that's a pretty makes this system pretty special. <laughs> that that's <laughs> I didn't realize that, <laughs> that meerkats were were, you know, lining up to get on the scales for a treat. That that's, yeah. that's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. I think um, that getting them to like hard boiled egg was also basically crucial to the success of the meerkat project <laughs> because they love hard-boiled egg. <laughs> it's sometimes harder to get them out of the scales than it can be to get them in. <laughs> that was the thing I learned in my PhD, actually. 
That's crazy. Have, yeah. I mean, that, that, that begs the question, have you seen um, them raiding, like, wild bird nests to get to egg now that they've developed a, a taste for it, but without the scale? Yeah, that's that's quite that's quite interesting. I'm not I'm not sure. Um, we've, I think Tim initially tried to give them uncooked egg actually because he thought that that might be more uh, sort of familiar to them or relevant to their like potential prey. But that didn't seem to that didn't seem to work. So I haven't seen them go for eggs. Um, I've seen them eat some pretty weird things though. <laughs> like they can. Use, uh, like it's like a frog that basically lives in the sand, and it it rains very little there, so it was very surprising to see an amphibian at all. But it, it's like an almost spherical frog, and so I think that was one of the weirdest things I've seen them eat. Is that the one that screams when it gets annoyed? <laughs> I don't know. This one must have been past the stage of being annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> Just straight to dead. <laughs> 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 That's crazy. Um, I like that the meerkats have got standards and will only deal with yeah. with properly cooked <laughs> egg. That's uh, <laughs> that's impressive stuff. <laughs> a retro bag of hard boiled egg from a meerkat is. That's <laughs> Cracky little <laughs> bastards. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's really cool. So this aloe nursing that you're talking about and studying is essentially um, the wild equivalent of of what humans back in the day and maybe still do in some situations, but the, the practice of wet nursing, correct? Where, you know, yes. a, a female is, is actually lactating. Are, are the females giving birth to their own offspring and then nursing somebody else's, or are they lactating without the birthing process? Yeah, so I, my understanding is that it's a bit of a mix of both. Um, unfortunately, we can only really tell if a female meerkat's pregnant uh, when she's about halfway through gestation because they don't really show any any weight gain until that point, possibly as a means of kind of sneaking it past the dominant female. So as as Tom alluded to before, Meerkat Manager teaches us so much. Um, th there is really strong reproductive suppression from the dominant female because obviously it's in her best interests that her offspring are the only ones being reared by the group and she can kind of monopolize the care. So she really aggressively um, tries to pre a prevent subordinate females getting pregnant, so preventing them from leaving the group to sneak off with roving males from other groups, which happens quite a lot. And then if they do get pregnant, she usually kicks them out of the group and then they abort from the stress of being outside the group. Um, or she'll kill their pups after the pups are born. So in quite a high number of cases, I, I did a, a little study looking at what the correlates were of aloe nursing behavior. And it seemed that the most common aloe nurses were females that had recently been pregnant or that had recently been kicked out of the group and had probably aborted. So I think it's probably the case that most of the time they've recently lost their own young, so they probably have excess milk. Um, but in, in other mongoose species, they have seen spontaneous lactation. And I think that, that can occur in rodents as well, where something about the hormonal mix of maybe being in a burrow with pups, it just stimulates stimulates milk production. Unfortunately, that wasn't something I was able to look at, but it, but it's possible that it's kind of a mix of both. It, it, it's very interesting that, you know, in some respects, the, the kicking them out has got the dual aspect of getting rid yeah. of your competition and, and the mouths that aren't directly yours to feed, while simultaneously providing a means for feeding your own offspring mouths. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's quite the yeah. system. Yeah, I definitely think that, that, that there is there is something like that and it, it, it's, it does seem kind of deliberate because these females will get kicked out, but then as soon as the dominant female has her pups, then they kind of come slink, slinking back in and they're allowed back into the group for the first time. So, yeah, it's, it's, it does seem very clever. <laughs> the things that you don't necessarily see when you see the little kits running around. <laughs> yeah. We don't have access to the BBC's uh, Meerkat Manor over here as much, but so we just get the cutesy bits, not the the real hard truths of life in in the desert. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not sure whether the ones that they showed in the UK had like a, a you know dead baby strewn <laughs> across the background, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe in the acting. Yeah, <laughs> the, like blood dripping from the mouths and the dead pops and. But I've seen that. 
That's the truth. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, don't go to the basement of Meerkat Manor. That, that's what I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe before we entirely ruin meerkats for uh, <laughs> anyone watching, then uh, we should we should move on to your your current work. So looking at uh, the he he's right. Um, so what what exactly like you spoke about it briefly at the start uh, using diet. So what are you looking at exactly? Yeah, so I I've been particularly interested in this uh, supplementation regime that they've been kind of doing on and off. So this, this particular population that my, my current supervisor, Rose Thurgood, mainly works on and has worked on, she worked on it for her PhD and helped to set it up, uh, is a translocated population of hee hee on Terry Terry Matangi Island, which is just off Auckland. So it's a really interesting population for lots of reasons, basically. So it's, it's reintroduced, so there's the whole aspect of looking at how the population dynamics change over the course of a reintroduction. Uh, they have a really interesting uh, breeding biology. So one of the facts that people liked a lot on BioTweeps today was that they're, I think, the only bird that, that has face-to-face -face copulations. <laughs> uh, and so it, it means that males can actually force females into copulations, which I think is also pretty unique in the bird world. So there's lots of extra pair paternity, which, of course, is common across birds, but it's possibly one of the few species where the extra pair paternity is not sought out by the females. It's actually very much resisted by the females. So they're really interesting in that regard as well. And there's a lot of inbreeding, obviously, as, as is the case with lots of small translocated populations. Um, so in an effort to, to boost these populations, they, they're supplementarily, supplementarily feed, fed. <laughs> <laughs> um, they kind of look like hummingbird feeders. They're, the birds themselves, I should probably kind of describe them. They're, they they look kind of like a thrush, I guess, or or they they look like a honey eater basically, and and they have that kind of bill and and they they're nectar feeders, so so they get fed sugar water as the supplementary uh, food. Um, um, just just uh, so we're totally clear, when you said face to face copulation, are we talking? Missionary <laughs> position or yeah, classic <laughs> missionary, nothing too weird. The oh, male can nice. see the female <laughs> down with his wings. Less nice. Yeah. Creepy yeah. missionary, <laughs> I think we'll see. <laughs> I've even just thinking about that the whole time I've been talking about supplementary feeding. Basically, yes. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. I just wanted to make sure that I had this image really clear. Yeah, you're <laughs> All right, you, you may continue. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so as well as the sugar water supplementation, uh, they've sort of uh, toyed with the idea of giving them extra extra things in their food that might be particularly good for their immune system. They're quite heavily parasitized by mites, as also is the case with lots of small birds, uh, and just anything that might be a bit of a boost. So we, they did this uh, carotenoid supplementation experiment. So carotenoids are basically antioxidant pigments that plants synthesize and uh, they're, kind of, they're taken up in, in the diet and they're really important for things like plumage coloration. And they're what make egg yolks yellow. They have this whole raft of positive effects on the immune system. Uh, I read an article today, apparently they're kind of being explored as, as having cancer fighting properties even in humans. So they're kind of this sort of super group of of, um, of pigments uh, and they're, they can be readily put into sugar water and used in supplementation experiments. Uh, so the team that that mostly do the the HEHE research which is it's sort of led by John Ewan who's at IOZ at uh, the Zoological Society of London, they did these carotenoid supplementation experiments about 10 years ago actually when Rose was doing her PhD and uh, they looked at the effects that they had on chick mass and growth and things like that then, but Rose had also noticed that they have uh, brood hierarchies and they weren't really sure what was generating them. And, and I was interested in seeing, because we know that carotenoids can compensate for the effects of natural stressors. So they do compensate, for example, for if, if a chick has mites, but it's got carotenoid supplementation, then they tend to reach the same mass, for example, as, yeah. as other chicks that 
don't have mites. Uh, so I was interested in, in how um, mothers might try and compensate for stressful conditions by maybe boosting coronoids in their eggs. So I, I've been using this coronoid uh, experiment data to kind of try and answer or test those sorts of ideas by looking at brood, at looking at these brood hierarchies, which is kind of it establishes a sort of natural gradient of stress within a brood. Um, so brood hierarchies, I'm sure most of most of the people who listen to the podcast will know, but it's basically when you get a size hierarchy within a within a within a nest. So one chick might hatch first and be bigger than the others, and and then there's a kind of gradient, or the first egg might have more resources, and then it ends up producing a bigger chick or it doesn't really matter how it how it's generated but it kind of creates this gradient of stress because the whether it's the last hatch one or just the kind of runty egg ends up losing out in competition so I've been interested in whether carotenoids mitigate those negative effects and that's something that we'll hopefully be publishing soon cool. uh, and I was, I've also been interested in I, I kind of spoke a little bit about how carotenoids are important in yellow plumage coloration so the, the females are kind of the classic drab, olivey brown of many birds, uh, but males are lovely. They're black and they've got these little white eyebrow tufts and then very yellow bands on their shoulders, um, which are, it's, it's carotenoid based plumage. So I've been interested in whether females that are given carotenoids produce eggs that have more males because the carotenoids boost the male coloration and then that influences uh, male breeding success further down the line. Uh, okay, that's cool. Yeah. Sorry, that was a long <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I was also going to say that I didn't know what a brood hierarchy was until you explained it. Oh, so uh, <laughs> any of our listeners who didn't know either, then you don't need to feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so that, that's an interesting hypothesis that you've got going on where, you know, um, I guess this is where your your sex differentiation and sex allocation is coming in, where if you're giving them things like carotenoids, like you say, that that would theoretically boost a male's chance of attracting a mate because they would potentially be brighter in their plumage, indicating a stronger um, health and attention. Um, yeah. Is there any evidence for for the females choosing to mate uh, to produce more males in that regard? Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, that that's kind of what I've been looking at so far it doesn't look like there is any sex ratio bias um, yeah I did a, a sex ratio variation paper on the meerkats as well which also showed zero bias so it's kind of becoming a trend through my career <laughs> uh, well you can just say that you're unbiased at all times that, that's not yeah. such a bad thing <laughs> I know just really neat <laughs> can, you, can you disentangle uh, you know, if these carotenoids are also good for the females then to what extent it's giving them a better ability to produce offspring as opposed to them actually deliver, like putting those carotenoids into the offspring. Does that make sense? Or is it just a sort of straightforward, like if you have more carotenoids, you can do more of everything? Um, yeah, so in, in zebra finches, for example, they, they have shown that it's, it's kind of a similar deal that carotenoids boost male coloration but don't really boost female coloration or success and and there they have shown that females produce more males uh, so that was kind of that that kind of led me to thinking that we might have this the same effect but it's it's also possible I mean in gold ventures they've also shown that female coloration is it might not be as important in sexual selection but it's just as important in uh, maintaining your territory for example mm -hmm. so it might be that actually they benefit females just as much or in, in other in other ways as you were saying it might just make these sort of super females who are also more able to produce better offspring later down the line um, so if you supplement adult female he he then they're more likely to have a second clutch in the same season so it's obviously boosting them in, in some way as well mm -hmm. does that sort of answer your question yeah <laughs> yeah. I was also, also kind of wondering whether uh, you know if if they're good for male plumage, then you know, is, 
like how how much carotenoids? Like, do you have any idea of like what's a sort of you know a small amount and what's a large amount? Is it best to create sort of one like male offspring who's just the yellowest little bastard you've ever seen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and actually, um, Layla Walker did some some nice work, kind of trying to disentangle what aspects of male coloration are actually important as well. So it seems that the little yellow eyebrows are what the females really like, and the the yellow bars are actually more to do with um, to do with territory acquisition and kind of scaring off other males. Mm. Um, so it might be that actually it's it doesn't really. It, it would be interesting to explore basically whether being super yellow actually translates into higher reproductive success, um, or whether it's more about the yellow, the the white tufts rather. So in that case, it might not actually be that that beneficial. Yeah, yeah. I th I was just wondering because I I think there's stuff with guppies where uh, the males use carotenoids to produce their kind of orange bits that the females like, but then also they get carotenoids from their food. So it's kind of it shows that they're good at acquiring resources, and then you've got the kind of yeah, yeah. indirect genetic benefits argument coming in. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, males actually also, as adults, um, they specifically target carotenoid-rich foods during the molt. So while carotenoid availability when they're young does predict their coloration as adults, it, it is also, it, like like the guppy example, it's kind of supplemented by by your own resource use as an adult. Right, yeah, so, so they have to. They may have to maintain throughout their life. They can't just yeah, yeah. Can't bank on mommy and daddy all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool so that brings up the question again so as you're feeding these and supplementing them are you selectively only supplementing females or are the males in the system also getting access to these these super slurries of carotenoid sugar juices um, and if so is that is that complicating things for you know why there wouldn't be more males in this being uh, birthed yeah, that could be the case. Uh, the, their protocol was to have one of these feeders, which looks like a hummingbird feeder, kind of in the territory of the of the female uh, at the nest. So females do all the incubating, so they're the ones that are around the nest for that key period up to from before incubating when they're egg laying and then all the way through chick rearing, whereas males are, are a bit more uh, mobile. But it's certainly possible that they're they're also getting that good stuff. Right. <laughs> it, it, it's almost like biology and these systems are complicated and we can't neglect all these variables. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Field <laughs> research, man. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess it's kind of like with the with the meerkats and the eggs the bits of egg where you, you know you want to do stuff as naturally as possible, but there are some yeah some little artifacts that you might bring in. And I guess if you want to do experiments in the field as well, then it get, must get even more difficult. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's all about the, the trade-offs that introducing that little weird hard-boiled egg thing, it does allow us to have this amazing resolution of, of uh, weight sequences. But yeah, but yeah, it's difficult to know how, how much to interfere, basically, or how close to get to the animals. That's That's been very different working with mammals and birds as well, I found that I just recently did some bird field work and it was quite hard to get used to not being able to basically just pick up your study species whenever you want to try and weigh <laughs> it. <laughs> just, binoculars the whole time. Just staying there with a piece of hard-boiled egg and they're not coming, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been spoiled for life, basically. <laughs> Was uh, was this the field work where you were sending tweets back about all all of your study species slowly dying over the course of the summer as well? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was like a Dickens novel. Yes, <laughs> I was working on uh, red-winged fairy wrens in Western Australia, and yeah, learning why they're a wonderful species and everyone works on them. Um, but yeah, they really get absolutely hammered by snakes and bad weather and. If they're not in the mood, then, yeah, <laughs> so what, what were you what were you studying them for? So fairy wrens are they're they're kind of a they're they're a guild of, of species in in Australia and they're found all over Australia, 
and they're all cooperative breeders again. So there's a dominant pair and they're helped usually by last year's offspring or the year before's offspring. So it's a slightly more kind of traditional family structure than you get in, in the meerkat groups, which can be a bit more fluid and there's a bit more movement. Um, so it's usually a dominant pair and then a son or a daughter from the year previously. And red wing fair wrens are quite unusual because you get helpers of both sexes. So usually it's one sex disperses and the other sex tends to stick around and be the particularly helpful sex. Yeah. So uh, the reason I, I went to work on them particularly was because I, uh, I was interested in, or I got interested particularly in how mothers respond to having help. So I, I did this study with the meerkats where I, I wanted to find out what the benefits actually are of allo nursing for mothers and offspring. And I constructed this very complicated model. And the hope was that I'd take allo nursing out of this ecological model where you have like, how does rainfall affect mother's weight? And how does that affect pup weight? And how does allo nursing affect this when rainfall is this and so on? And basically I found out that it basically has very little effect, which wasn't what I was expecting because the assumption always is if a pup has a separate food source, then presumably it's going to get fatter, but that wasn't the case. And what they found in the fairy wrens actually is that if a female has access to helpers, then she'll put less into her egg. So you end up with a smaller offspring, but then the helpers compensate for it and you don't see any effect. And that kind of blew my mind and I was really excited by that and kind of was interested to know if that was what was happening in the meerkats but I hmm. couldn't really think of a way to, to test it because it's much easier to look at what's in an egg than what's in an embryo in a meerkat. <laughs> that you can't that tell is pregnant really, for six months. Yeah, there are ethics <laughs> issues. Uh, but <laughs> the fairy wren systems, which, which are really cool, and there's basically every different combination of cooperative care that you can get across these different species. So that got me interested in... Do mothers basically adjust what, what they invest in their offspring based on the composition of the group? Um, so that's that's what I was trying to look at basically by increasing uh, chick begging at the nest and then seeing how males and females respond differently and then secondarily how do mothers then respond given any potential differences in male and female response. So if, if females are putting less into their offspring. Is that so that they can have more or they can live longer and have further clutches or what's what's the yeah, sort of think, general hypothesis? I think in that in that study the, the the clutch size was the same. So it's more than about residual reproductive value. So what you put into your current batch of offspring basically is sort of taking away from what you can put into your next batch or your next batch. Mm. So any opportunity that you get to put less in but still get the same amount out, basically, uh, that's that's the holy grail, I guess, in female reproductive decisions. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think they, they possibly also showed that it has effects on long term survival and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit depressing when a lot of uh, sort of behavioural ecology work essentially comes down to treating animals like little uh, accountants with spreadsheets who are yeah, trying to yeah. figure out how to uh, how to maximise what they get out of their budget. <laughs> um, so I think we're we're kind of near the end, but I know that you are starting a new job soon. Um, can you can you give us a, a little sneak peek into what you're going to be doing? Yeah, sure. So I have got a postdoc with Michael Sheriff and Tracy Lankeld at Penn State, which I'm really excited about. Uh, and Michael works on maternal stress effects, basically, and, and how they may or may not be adaptive. And Tracy's got this fantastic system. She works on eastern fence lizards, which are found in the, the southeast of the US. And some populations of fence lizards have been hit quite hard by fire ants, which are this invasive ant, um, which is a novel predator and also a novel prey of this of this species. So it's a really interesting dynamic between these two, because obviously how how a lizard responds to the stress of being in the presence of a predator is very different when a predator is a a bird or a mammal compared to if it's an ant. And how you would deal with the how you deal with those different predators is obviously very different. So they've evolved very different stress responses. 
uh, and Michael and Tracy are interested in how that then affects the next generation and whether there are sort of whether, whether there might be a mismatch in how the mother might prepare an offspring for a stressful environment if it then ends up in a different environment. So if it's born in a non-fire ant invaded environment but then finds itself in a fire ant environment and it's Kind of instinct is to respond to predators in one way but then it might that might be totally non-adaptive if it's a this totally novel predator so those are the kind of ideas that i'm going to be exploring so i'm pretty excited so i'll be moving to pennsylvania and my field work will be in alabama so i'll get to see a lot of the states awesome <laughs> and <laughs> even better i'm going to be doing some stuff on maternal stress as well and i'll be doing some of that in alabama so we can definitely oh, hang cool. out <laughs> <laughs> it's just like one small little family all over. <laughs> you guys could be like the the American meerkat manor. You bring that <laughs> bring that over, except without the weird stuff that we talked about earlier. Don't don't bring I'm that sure over. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that could be trouble. Well, that's great. I guess we should wrap it up. Um, we'll let uh, Kirsty get back to to doing all this awesome work. Um, you do a lot of outreach and stuff as well, it looks like. Uh, can you tell everybody where they can follow along with all your outreach and all this cool work and field work that you're, you're about to set out on? Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll definitely be tweeting, tweeting about my experiences as I go. So uh, you can find me at Kirsty Jean, uh, which is K-I-R-S-T-Y-J-E-A-N. This week I'm on BioTweets, so if you jump on there you'll see the link to my Twitter page. Uh, and I have a blog as well, which is kjmcleod.wordpress.com. I'll definitely also be blogging about being a little Scott in the big <laughs> trust. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely be posting, posting there. Awesome. That's great. And, uh, of course, like usual, we'll have uh, links to all of Kirsty's sites and, and social media feeds um, on our website with this episode, which is at breakingbio.com. Um, and of course you can follow along, we'll of course add her and retweet all of her stories as we go along on our <laughs> Twitter feed, at Breaking Bio. Um, so I want to thank uh, Kirsty so much for, for joining us this week, it was really great talking to you uh, and, and joining us back in, in this new season uh, of Breaking Bio. And for everybody listening at home, reminding, like we said, you can find us on Twitter at Breaking Bio, our website is breakingbio.com, we are on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Breaking Bio podcast. But we also need to thank the European Society for Evolutionary Biology, who provides us with some money to keep this thing going. So I think that's it for episode 95. Everybody, I hope you'll join us next week when we have a new guest, and it won't be two months this time. It'll be actually next week for reals. Mm -hmm.